It's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Pesky from the University of Vermont. Uh, Melissa uses a combination of genomics, population genetics, ecology, physiology, anthropology, a mix of different things, to investigate um, the mechanisms that both promote and maintain biodiversity. Uh, she received her BSc and BA from UC San Diego, uh, PhD from Stanford, and did a postdoc at Indiana before starting at Vermont just a month ago. Um, <clears throat> so she's going to tell us about her work investigating the capacity for evolution in response to uh, environmental change in sea urchins and the mechanisms underlying diversification in horny beetles. Thanks. Thanks, Veronica, for that introduction. And thank you all for coming to this talk, especially since it's at a different time, I understand. Um, and for the invitation to, to come here, this is uh, fantastic, especially since I've just started my time at Vermont, to know that I'm so close to so many great minds here. I've had an awesome time so far. And also for me personally, as a native of warmer habitats, it's nice to know that there is this bustling metropolis north of me, that, that I'm not at the range edge of civilization. So <laughs> thank you for that, too. <laughs> So, but anyhow, right now it's my pleasure to tell you about my research in these two lovely organisms, sea urchins and corn fields, where my overarching goal is to understand the mechanisms that both promote and impact the incredible biodiversity that we observe on this planet. So, an overarching goal in evolutionary biology is to understand the mechanisms that in the genetic and developmental underpinnings of variation in nature. And arguably, much of this variation is underlined by complex traits. And by complex traits, I mean traits that are shaped by the action of many genes acting in concert, or that may depend on the environmental conditions in which they're expressed. And some well-studied examples of these include eye spot patterning in butterflies, variation in flowering time in plants, and even height in humans, as nicely exemplified in this picture of the famous jockey Rose Shoemaker standing next to the famous basketball player Will Chamberlain on the beach in Malibu in the 1970s. So in addition to these, these dramatic morphological phenotypes, there are also physiological phenotypes that we may not be able to see, but we can measure, such as flight performance in insects, drought tolerance in plants, and susceptibility to disease in humans or in any of these organisms. So uh, the, the goal of my research is to understand the evolution of these complex traits as they've been evolving for millions of years or as they're faced with rapidly changing conditions in contemporary climates. And specifically, the two questions in my research program or that I aim to address in my lab, and it's really fun to be able to say that for the first time, are well, what are the genetic bases of these complex phenotypes? And can species and populations adapt to rapidly changing climate conditions? And specifically, I address these questions in sea urchins and horned beetles, where the specific questions can be broken down like this. So which genes and functional pathways underlie this variation? And are phenotypes due to changes in coding or regulatory regions? And which developmental stages and body regions are subject to natural selection? And to address these questions, I need to create genomic approaches in a population genetics and molecular evolution framework using both developmental biology and physiology, and always in the context of the ecology and evolution of the organisms with both lab and field-based experiments. So today I'll tell you two stories, one about physiological phenotypes important for survival in future climate conditions, and one about dramatic morphological phenotypes in these three closely related but wildly morphologically diverged species. And the specific questions are, do purple sea urchins have the genetic capacity to be able to evolve in response to ocean acidification? And what are the molecular underpinnings of morphological diversity encompassed in these three horned beetle species? So first, let me start by reviewing something that may be elementary to this audience, but it's nice to have everyone on the same page. So what are the evolutionary forces that are acting when an organism is distributed across the heterogeneous landscape? So when the forces of gene flow or dispersal are high, populations look genetically similar. However, when the forces of natural selection or random genetic drift and demography are strong, you can have populations that diverge. And this is where the power and promise of genomic approaches comes into play. 
because the forces of random genetic drift, demography, and gene flow have genome-wide effects, whereas natural selection acts on specific loci targeting the genome. And this is where you can use genomics to be able to parse, presumably, these neutral versus selected uh, loci using various statistical analyses. And the promise is that of discovery, because you're taking a presumably unbiased approach to be able to test for signals of natural selection. So for this first question, let me begin by telling you about the purple sea urchin. So the purple sea urchin is a fundamental player in inter- and subtitle ecology from all the way to the cold waters of Alaska, all the way down to the warmer waters of Baja, California, Mexico. And this is a sea surface temperature map that you'll see a few of this time. So what you're looking at here is the eastern Pacific Ocean. Here is Alaska, here's California, and the land is in black. So this is a broadly dispersing species. They are dioecious, so there are males and females, they release their gametes into the water column where fertilization occurs. And the resulting larvae, as exemplified by this little image here, can spend weeks to months in the water column before recruiting to a suitable place to live. So there is a strong uh, gene flow and high dispersal potential. And they're also distributed across this broad latitudinal gradient, so strong potential for selection. And as you can get a sense for in this lower photo here, they also have dramatically large population sizes. So these combination of forces, so large population sizes, high gene flow, maximize the effects of natural selection while they minimize the effects of random genetic drift and demography. Making them a powerful system to be able to study the processes, the balance between gene flow and natural selection, uh, to test if it's possible for the species to adapt to local environmental conditions despite the homogenizing effects of gene flow. So there are, I found several signals of selection across this highly dispersing, broadly distributed organism. And one of those, the first signals was that of population differentiation when looking across the whole genome. So previous studies had found no population structure in neutral loci along this vast longitudinal gradient. But looking across the genome, I found that there were signals of differentiation. And a lot of that differentiation was concentrated in the regulatory regions of genes, particularly regions of E3 ligases, or regulatory regions of E3 ligases, which are genes related to ubiquitination. So basically, this is regulating the regulators, so the, those that control the specific degradation of, of proteins. And also, uh, excess heterozygosity in coding regions of innate immunity genes. And this was particularly a strong signal in the southern part of the species range where there's actually higher disease pressure, so higher potential selective forces for increasing immune responses. And finally, for, I found a signal in a common garden ex experiment that while most of the transcriptome shows a signal of physiological plasticity, basically northern and southern urchins have a one-to-one -one line for their gene expression patterns, there was a suite of genes related to biomineralization which is the growth, the process of growing a skeleton for many of these marine organisms um, with higher expression in southern populations than northern populations, and also in a suite of other growth-related genes, suggesting that there are genetically controlled differences in, in the regulation of specific classes of genes between populations. And finally, I found that there was a signal, signature of correlations with local temperature and other signatures of positive selection in putatively adaptive loci that showed up as outliers in, uh, in the genome scan um, that were not present in signals of putatively neutral loci. So those all show signal signatures of, of adaptive evolution occurring potentially over, across millions of years. But what I wanted to know next was, can these this highly dispersing, broadly distributed species adapt to these future conditions? And it, it's I'll tell you first about what the threat is. What is ocean acidification? Well, it's also known as the other CO2 problem. So as, as we emit CO2 into the atmosphere, about a third of that is absorbed, absorbed by the Earth's oceans, uh, which is about 22 million tons a day. And that is a really difficult number to fathom. But my back of the envelope calculation, so tons, tons of CO2, even though it's a gas, we're talking about the mass. So that would be about 4.4 million elephants bubbling into the ocean every single day. And I know that's still difficult to imagine. But so as these 4.4 million elephants bubble into the ocean every day, the, this increases this, the acidity of the seawater, lowering the pH. 
which makes has in the last few hundred years has dropped the pH from about 8.2 to 8.1, which may not sound like much if you're if you're not familiar with the log scale of pH, but it's actually a 25% increase in acidity. And this results in challenges for the growth and maintenance of shells and skeletons for many organisms such as corals, mussels, urchins, lobsters, other plankton that have calcareous structures, such as illustrated with this pteropod here, which is, you're seeing just the shell here, the live organism is this one here. And as it's been exposed from zero to 45 days in elevated CO2 conditions predicted for the year 2100, you can see the dissolution of their, their shell. So these effects can have major impacts on, on species survival, ecosystem services, et cetera. So the major question in biology today is can species and populations adapt? And an excellent place for studying this is, is the west coast of North America where there's been this ongoing natural experiment for the last uh, 10 million years when the process of upwelling set up where it's a, it's a wind-driven process that results in bringing up of cold, nutrient-rich, low pH waters along this coast. And in, in general, there's a lot of spatial heterogeneity, as you can see in these plumes here in purple. Here's the San Francisco Bay and Monterey Bay. These plumes of purple are, are cold, low pH, upwell water. And in general, there's a north to south gradient with upwell and being more strong in the north and less strong in the south. So I hypothesize that species that have evolved in these environments where they're experiencing regional and temporal variation in these high CO2 conditions may harbor genetic variation for being able to evolve in response to this future ocean acidification conditions. So to test this hypothesis, I designed a larval selection experiment that I conducted with the Ocean Margin Ecosystems Group for Acidification Studies, an NSF-funded collaborative project and the Bodega Ocean Acidification Research Team at UC Davis, University of California, Davis. And what we did was collected adults from seven populations along the species range, brought them into the lab, spawned 10 males and 10 females, and raised the resulting larvae in, elevated, in ambient and elevated CO2. And this elevated CO2 is to mimic conditions and the base, the, the uh, middle of the road prediction for, for future climate business as usual is what they call it, climate scenario. And we sampled every two days for morphometrics, and that days one and seven for the genomic analyses. And I chose these days one and seven because it spans a period of major skeletal growth that would be really important for the, the feeding ability and, and presumably fitness of these organisms. So going into it, we had a number of processes that we predicted might be affected by low pH based on a number of physiological studies. Can anybody name things you might expect to be involved? What might be affected by low pH conditions? Calcification? Yeah, yeah, biomobilization definitely. And growth and development are some of the other things. And if you were really fast on your devices or whatever, you could look up the, the papers down there that have shown these things. But exactly what you said, biomobilization, calcification, as you can see, if, if you looked closely at this picture, they have these beautiful skeletal rods in their arms, and the, the length of these arms is really important for them as they have, they're ciliated and that's how they feed. So the longer arms, the more they feed, um, the more they can grow. And without this, uh, there's definitely challenges for growth and development. And other categories, other types of, of cellular functions that have shown to be important are things related to maintaining your intracellular pH, which would be things related to ion homeostasis and cell membrane maintenance. So here's a schematic of what the selection experiment looked like. So we have larvae raised in ambient CO2 and in elevated CO2 starting from the same genetic stock. And I sampled about 1,000 larvae for each of these treatments at day one when they're freshly hatched blastula. And then again, sampled another thousand larvae at day seven when their forearm clutei. And then sampled for, and this was done for each of the seven populations of these four treatments, and uh, sequenced each of these 28 samples on 28 um, IC claims, resulting about in 112,000 gigabase pairs of data, from which I whittled down to about 19,000 high quality SNPs. And from the SNPs for each population pool, I can estimate real frequency 
And here's a schematic of what that looks like. So we're looking at an AG polymorphism here. The frequency of the A or the yellow allele is 0.65. And after development six days in these high CO2 conditions, the frequency of the A allele is now 0.79. So that's a change in allele frequency of about 14% through time. And I could do that not for just for that one locus, but across the whole uh, genome and get a genome-wide distribution for this change in allele frequency. And I'll walk you through one way of, that I use to test for signals of selection in this. So I can address the question, are changes in allele frequency driven by by selection, partly through functional enrichment analyses. So in this distribution in gray, you're looking at the, the distribution of change in allele frequency. The red tick marks below are the individual data points. So populations or species, whatever the example may be, are more similar over here on the left and more different, of course, over here on the right. In the categories of everything based on the function of the genes. So for example, apoptosis and bottom normalization genes. If I look at the change in allele frequency across the genome-wide distribution of, of these, of all genes related to apoptosis, would you expect that these are randomly sampled from this distribution? Would there be functional enrichment or not in this case? Does this distribution look similar to this distribution? Yes? If the distribution is random, Yeah, exactly. So no selection. It looks like it's just a random sample from that distribution. So there's no functional enrichment. There's no, no difference here. In contrast, if we look at the distribution of this biomineralization genes and where they fall with respect to the genome-wide distribution, does this look random or not? That's right. So highly enriched. So highly, much more different than you would expect by chance. So a signal that that this non-random distribution suggests the action of natural selection because you wouldn't expect by chance for specific functional classes of genes to all have the same degree of response if there wasn't some uh, non-neutral uh, process in action. So what we would predict in this case in terms of for the enrichment is to see the changes in allele frequency are random with respect to function in the, elevate, in the ambient CO2 conditions but in the elevated CO2 conditions, if there is selective mortality, you would expect to see some signals of specific functional classes changing. And after one day in high CO2 conditions, there's, there's a possibility of seeing changes. And here is what we found. In terms of the morphological results, there are very, actually very minor effects of high CO2. So the only consistent uh, negative effect that we saw was body length. So in the high CO2 conditions, the animals were about 4 to 5% smaller. But all the other morphometric measurements that we took, in the other arm lengths and stomach size, they were exactly the same in the two treatments. And also all the populations were the same. So it had this consistent 45% smaller, but not, no other signatures. And there was also no developmental delay. And these results are actually kind of in contrast to what previous people have shown for this species. And we think that maybe because we're growing them at such low densities that there was, there was actually no other combined stressor. No developmental delay, and they were all equally competent to metamorphose. But these seeming minor effects uh, in the morphology were underlain by major effects in the genomic scale. So at day one, between day one and day seven, there were the changes in allele frequency were, were indeed, as we predicted, random with respect to protein function. In contrast, in the elevated CO2 conditions, there were 40 different functional classes of genes that showed excess uh, change in allele frequency, and those were largely related to ion homeostasis and lipid metabolism. And uh, matching our predictions for random versus uh, selective mortality. And even after one day in high CO2 conditions, there were actually 42 functional categories uh, showing elevated uh, allele frequency changes. And those were also in categories related to ion homeostasis and lipid metabolism. So these results could be because of selective mortality, as what I've suggested here, but I also sequenced from RNA, so it could be that there's differences in growth between the treatments, so larger individuals are contributing more alleles to the sequencing. 
We saw relatively minor effects of, of the treatment on growth, but it is a possibility. Um, and this is, uh, would be interesting also, could confer, it could be suggested of a fitness advantage of increased growth, growth nonetheless. It could also be due to the differential expression of alleles. Um, and I tested for genome-wide signatures of that and also sequenced from DNA and didn't see any signatures of that. So the most likely explanation is through this selective mortality. So these results are really remarkable in that we find the predicted patterns and that they're matching functional categories that were predicted to be involved. And the same genes are targeted after seven days and it's after one day in the ICO2 patients. Yeah. So Felipe, I better get my question now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, in the ambient CO2, it's also like you take in wild critters and put them into the lab. So that's like in five, there's no selective differences at all between the lab and the wild. There definitely could be. Yeah, so so I, I didn't necessarily think I would get zero here. I thought that there, there could be a chance. And, and one of the, the predictions was just that they were going to be different and that these categories would be related to something to high CO2 and that these would be some lab random, you know, they don't like the water from the Digga Bay or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, and, and the really cool thing that it is, is that 71% of these genes um, that are changing after one day and after seven days are the same, and that the change in allele frequency is actually greater through time as you would expect. So I was basically capturing baby steps of, of evolution in action, or at least the first steps of it. And an independent measure of, of the new frequency is that there were excess amino acid changing polymorphisms in these same specific functional classes of genes. So what I've shown you in this is that there are minimal outward effects of, of the low pH, but this was underlain by major changes in, uh, in genetic changes in specific classes of genes related to ion homeostasis, lipid metabolism, and biomineralization. So this, uh, these minimal phenotypic effects were enabled likely by these changes in specific classes of genes just across seven days of selection. But what I wanted to know now is, or next was, where is this variation coming from in nature? And to get at that, um, I used, we collected high frequency pH data along the species range from the same locations, right adjacent to where we collected the adult uh, virgins for the experiment. Uh, except there are six sites rather than seven because uh, one of the loggers was, was pulled out of the tide pool by a storm. But generally you can see that there, um, I ranked them based on the average pH, average time spent at less than pH 7.8. And generally con conditions are much more acidic in the north than in the south. And as a representative for allele frequencies in the wild, I use the day one control treatment. Um, so basically, 40 chromosomes sampled from the, from the wild um, to test and tested for correlations with these local pH conditions. And from those, I identified a suite of genes that were that were or used again that whole distribution of correlations to test for functional enrichment in specific. Uh, classes of genes and found that very similar classes of genes correlated with local pH conditions just from the wild. So I hate to read a list to you, but I, uh, I think it's remarkable. So the top one is energy coupled proton transport against an electrochemical gradient. Number two is biomineralization. Number three is a new one that didn't show up in the selection experiment, but cell cell adhesion, proton transport, lipid oxidation other things that you might predict to be involved in responding to low pH. So it's the same functional classes that responded to experimental acidification are showing correlations with local pH conditions. And just to show you what one of these uh, genes look like, this is phosphoribosyltransferase, transferase, and the allele frequency um, on the y-axis and the, the, different, the six different sites are ranked from lowest pH to highest pH generally north to south, and this is an extremely strong client in purple sea urchins. So because of the high dispersal potential um, to get this, this sort of a, a clinal pattern, it takes uh, a lot of repeated selection on dispersing larvae. So this is, this is one of the uh, putatively local, local adapt, or low pH allele. And now what I wanted to look at was are these 
are we seeing response in experiment in the experimental acidification? So if I put on here after seven days in the high CO2 treatment, the change in allele frequency, I find that these low that the populations from the higher pH environment are showing an increase in the frequency of the low pH, putative low pH adaptive allele. So this is exactly what we would expect if this um, if this allele is actually conferring a, a benefit in this uh, high CO2 conditions. And this is not happening just in a single gene that I'm showing you. This actually happened across the genome in all of the 318 genes that I, would, that I characterized as putatively low pH adapted. So all of those that are showing a signature of correlation with local pH conditions. So what you're looking at here is in the black, the low pH populations that we presume would have a higher frequency already of those alleles, and then the red are the high pH populations that would need to increase the frequency of this allele in response to high CO2 conditions. So this is, sorry, change in allele frequency in response to high CO2. So you see this more dramatic response in the high CO2 populations for increasing this low pH adaptive allele. And I know that's really kind of complicated, but I think that's probably the coolest result I'll, sh I'll show you. So does that make sense? And I'll tell it to you again if it doesn't. Does it make sense? So you're having an increase in frequency of this, of this putatively low pH adaptive allele. Did you follow? Yeah, mostly? Okay, cool. And then the promising note here, the silver lining, is that these low, putative low pH adaptive alleles are present in all populations because this is such a high gene flow system. So to summarize that, I found that there are correlations with local pH conditions in biomineralization, proton transport, and metabolic genes, and that these putatively low pH adaptive alleles show the greatest response to experimental acidification in the high pH populations, suggesting that there is local adaptation to conditions in the wild, or, or to local pH conditions in the wild, and that the same putative low pH adaptive alleles are targeted in the wild and in experimental acidification conditions. So to the conclusions for this are that these purple sea urchins may in fact have the genetic capacity to respond to elevated CO2 from standing genetic variation, and that this standing genetic variation may in fact come from the natural variation that they experience in pH conditions in the wild. But the Remaining questions and what I aim to address in the next few years in my lab are what are the costs and consequences of such rapid evolution and the loss of genetic diversity that's occurring? And are there, is there sufficient genetic variation to respond to multiple environmental stressors such as changes in pH, temperature, disease, and availability of food? And presuming that I started with what might be the most uh, robust organism, does the degree of environmental heterogeneity experienced during the species evolutionary history predict their resilience or vulnerability to future climate conditions. So to, I'll give you a, a, an example of how I aim to address that, that last point. So in other words, who will be the vulnerable <coughs> users in future climate conditions? So I think that I've probably started with the most um, robust of species. So it's the purple sea urchin. Again, here you're looking at North America, Pacific, Atlantic, we have this broad latitude of distribution. Uh, there's the green sea urchin, Strongus protus trabacchiensis, that has been isolated, has isolated populations um, that have been separated from probably the last three million years. This one experiencing upwelling, and this one not. Uh, which you would expect that possibly this has a greater capacity for responding to high CO2 conditions compared to the Atlantic population. And then because of the upwelling and lack of upwelling. And then there's the white sea urchin, which is generally uh, in, uh, a tropical genus, the Echinus. It has these two populations here that this one actually in the, in the north experiences less upwelling and in the south experiences more. So they have differences in range size, population size, and degree of environmental heterogeneity, all factors that you might expect to affect an organism's ability to adapt and evolve. And the variegatus sea urchin would be a nice comparison because they have a broad distribution, but they experience what would be considered more stable environmental conditions across the, the tropical Caribbean there. So you could, you could set up these predictions that I started with the most resilient, 
followed by the Pacific um, Dravakiensis population, then the Atlantic, then there's uh, Baja versus the Southern California, and then it would be interesting to see where Parity Goddess falls with respect to these. So a broad comparative framework to be able to, to test uh, which species have that evolutionary capacity. And they're all models in developmental biology with extensive genomic resources. So to, the take home for that is that purple sea urchins seem to be able to adapt to these local conditions and may be able to evolve in response to future climate conditions, climate change. And this species, or sea urchins in general, are an excellent system for understanding this balance between gene flow and natural selection, be they at geologic or contemporary time scales. But where they provide relatively few opportunities is for understanding complex phenotypes that may vary depending on environmental conditions and, for example, the sex of the organism or the nutritional status. And for this reason, I started to work on um, beetles. And these beetles also present the opportunity for studying gene function, making that link between genotype and phenotype um, by using RNA interference. So for this, I'll address the question, what are the molecular underpinnings? of morphological diversity in these three species. So what you need to know about beetles is that they are inordinately diverse, not only in terms of species richness, there are more named beetle species than anything else, but they're diverse in terms of feeding types. There are omnivores, herbivores, carnivores, beetles that focus on or specialize in specific fungi or, or dominoes you'll hear about in, in, in a few minutes. And they are inordinately diverse in the expression of these secondary sexual traits, you know, horns, that uh, you can see nicely example exhibited here. And the Anthophagus genus is the most, argue, people say, the most speciose genus in the animal kingdom. So there are some 2,400 species described in the genus, and the variation that is encompassed in their horns is nicely illustrated in this image by Edlin et al. Uh, that shows how the species can vary in the size, shape, position, and number of horns that they have. And the, the, a bit about their ecology, why they have these horns, well, they're used for fighting for access to mates. So they find their dung beetles, so they find a patty and the, the females tunnel and build these brood balls um, using the dung. And inside each brood ball, she